Greetings, welcome to the Transforming Assessment webinar series. Today's session is a joint uh, joint effort with the Big Business Education Special Interest Group under Ascolite. Uh, today is a panel, a panel session on authentic assessment in business education. And we're asking the question, is this a panacea for a hybrid teaching world? Um, so Danielle, as my co-chair, would you like to lead off with the next sort of introduction part? Thank you, Matthew, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Danielle Logan and we welcome you to the session today as Matthew said. I'd like to start by uh, having an acknowledgement of country. I'm at Griffith University on the Gold Coast in Yungam Bear country today and on behalf of us all wherever we may be in the world, I'd like to acknowledge the tra traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today and pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging and I extend that respect to all Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and First Nations people joining us for this session. As Matthew mentioned, uh, you're here for, trans, um, uh, for transforming assessment uh, at, jointly with the business education SIG and we thought we'd just take a little moment to tell you a little bit of, about who we are. Um, we are a, a group that was formed, a new group that was formed as a part of Ascolite in 2020 and we aim to foster technology enhanced business education and to really raise the profile of scholarship of technology enhanced business education among both professional accreditation bodies and ranking agencies. There's many ways to be involved in the business education seat. Memberships open to everyone, including non-Ascolite members. Uh, so please consider joining us for our regular webinar series or uh, consider submitting papers to the business education track at the annual SIG conference at the annual Ascolite conference. For more information, you can scan the QR code in the uh, slide that's on the screen here um, or access the slides at the end of the session for the links. I just put so the link in the text chat. <laughs> thank you very much. Excellent work, my fellow moderator. Thank you, Matthew. So tonight's session has a really interesting agenda. We're going to look firstly at our panel's experience that they've had uh, working with authentic assessment in business related uh, disciplines. And then we're going to have a panel discussion uh, around some major topics that have been emerging uh, in this area. Then we'd like to turn it over to you and let's have a look at the sort of designs that you've been working with or you're thinking of working with and we're going to have a nice, uh, create a, a resource there of, of um, capturing what's happening in business education. Uh, and then we're going to discuss some troubleshooting uh, around this area as well and have a good question time. So that's where we, we hope to head to. Our panellists I'd like to introduce for this evening. Uh, firstly, we have Dr. Uh, Associate Professor Poppy Satiriadu uh, from the Department of Tourism, Sport and Hotel Management at Griffith University. Poppy is a senior fellow and higher education academy at that, sorry, a senior fellow in the Higher Education Academy and she has several learning and teaching research grants. She's been recognised with awards for her excellence in learning and teaching and over the past five years Poppy's dedicated her learning and teaching pedagogies in designing uh, and offering authentic experiences to students. We're also very fortunate tonight to be joined by Dr. Amanda White, who is the Deputy Head of Education at, uh, in, of the Accounting Discipline at the University of Technology in Sydney uh, in the business school there. She's been teaching accounting for almost two decades, uh, focusing on auditing and assurance at the undergraduate level. Her areas of interest include use of platforms for collaboration and social learning, preparing students for graduate employment uh, and academic integrity. Welcoming Dr. Charmaine Fleming, uh, who is a lecturer from Federation University in uh, teaching into the brand new International Sport Management degree there. Uh, she's based at Mount Helen campus in Ballarat uh, in a School of Science, Psychology and Sport. She's been involved in the development of the content for this new degree uh, and is an advocate for curriculum alignment and authentic assessment design. Her teaching focus links student learning to current and future sport industry trends, uh, preparing students to be future innovative sport managers. Welcoming our colleagues from Ireland now, we have Dr Monica Ward, who is the Assistant Head of Teaching and Learning in the School of Computing at Dublin City University. She's got exp extensive experience as a university lecturer in computing and is particularly interested in the use of technology in education. 
Monica is a keen believer in authentic assessment and students as partners in assessment. She's taught a range of subjects from technical computing modules to transversal skill modules, from first year to undergraduate to postgrad, and she's lectured in Ireland, El Salvador and South Arabia, uh, Saudi Arabia. Finally, and last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Fiona Ariadon, who is a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy and is an academic developer in the Teaching Enhancement Unit at Dublin City University. She has a vast experience in teaching and higher education on both undergraduate and postgraduate business and education programs. She originally completed uh, undergraduate and master's levels in business degrees. As her love of teaching grew, she undertook a Master of Education and more recently completed her Doctor of Education research on curriculum development. Her research areas include assessment, academic integrity, the voice of educators and curriculum and de development. So I know you'll all join me in welcoming our panel uh, to be chaired by Matthew and myself, as we mentioned. And I'd like to invite uh, Poppy Satiriadu now to uh, hop on and uh, share her experience with us, please. Thanks, Danielle and Matthew. Um, I have to um, say thank you for having me on board and um, how much I enjoy Matthew's giggle now and then when he um, does something that is remarkable and he's happy with himself. <laughs> so um, I'd like to um, set the scene a little bit about uh, how the, the work that I've done came about. And over the past, I'd say five to six years at least, we've all been treading on uh, fine ice, trying to balance uh, student engagement, offering skill development and PLOs and employability, uh, enhancing retention and preventing uh, or enhancing academic integrity. And all those things had to be done whilst at the same time, uh, we have to balance the challenges of offering face-to-face -face and online courses, sometimes um, at once, uh, learning and applying new technologies for asynchronous and synchronous learning, building content assessment fast, efficiently, in interactive ways, ensuring students can learn anytime and anywhere. It almost feels like mission impossible. And um, uh, and across the higher education, there has been uh, that need to balance those um, demands. And on the backdrop of all that, those pressures, with the input of a very talented, small, but yet passionate group of colleagues that I have been working over the past five to six years, uh, we framed and tested um, six key principles of authentic assessment design uh, that enabled us to carefully and evidence-based develop and implement scaffolded authentic and personalized, personalized assessments. And um, this is the, the model the, or the, the characteristics that I was talking about. I'm only going to talk about the um, aspects that we see in the um, uh, yellow part of the model um, due to time restrictions. But um, um, the, the principles of authentic assessment design uh, that we have um, come um, across uh, that worked for us in a lot of contexts are uh, to have scaffolded um, assessments uh, and provide support along the way, including, for instance, mock interviews, uh, practice the rubrics, the assessment criteria, essential tools for students to see the scope of the assessment, um, have clarity and engage in the process during um, their study or the course or the program. So this also leads to another key design principle that assessments are set in a scenario-based context and scenarios um, not only contextualise the assessment, but enable students to see the relevance to real work situations and reflect on that or link it to the theory of the course and then articulate these links in their assessment tasks. The also assessment tasks should align to the program and program learning outcomes. Um, special consideration should be given to uh, accessibility and equity requirements to ensure the assessment design does not disadvantage certain students. And last, assessments are designed in ways that offer tasks reflective of the workplace that naturally extend from the discipline area, therefore are highly professionally uh, focused. 
Now, um, there's um, a lot of ways that we have applied these principles uh, across all assessments in a single course. Uh, assessment one, scaffolded to assessment two, to assessment three, in the, um, scenario based, and so forth, all the six principles. Uh, we have then applied those principles in offering authentic assessments within a program. And um, I build a, a case where year one um, assessments are scaffolded and provide the groundwork for year two and so forth. And other programs. Um, I'm, I'm already past my time, <laughs> but I want to focus on one recent example that's quite exciting. And um, this is um, the um, uh, application of authentic assessments in a real model of offering opportunities for students to engage as researchers. So quickly, uh, the, um, an example here is uh, we have a community-based will that is offered across Griffith. Uh, that is open to students that are interested in doing um, uh, their will in a research program. In this instance, uh, the Titans have a project where they're looking at expanding the league to offering opportunities for people with disabilities to compete. So the students engage in collecting data, analysing it and so forth and reporting it. Um, so they work with the researchers and they work with the academics and the wheel team as research partners to produce um, authentic assessments that are research based and disseminate that knowledge across um, the industry um, and through market credentials. So um, in closing, um, is um, to, uh, in answering the question is, uh, authentic assessment, the panacea, um, perhaps it's good to see a metaphor. Is COVID-19 vaccine the answer to the pandemic when the virus is changing, i.e. our own environment as educators? The novelty of the vaccine may seem daunting for some, and it is natural to question, for questions to arise on their effectiveness. And whilst efficacy refers to how vaccine performs under ideal lab conditions, effectiveness refers to how it performs in the real world. And to bring it back to our context, we have always and only measured our success of applying authentic assessment using effectiveness. And we know how they perform based on empirical data collected over a period of five years. And our data supports the notion that authentic assessment, tick all the boxes we want them to, and hopefully they are not as daunting to our colleagues considering taking the jab. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Poppy. Uh, there's some interesting uh, conversations starting to happen in the chat there too. That's a really interesting metaphor. Uh, I'd now like to invite uh, Dr. Amanda White to take the microphone, please, and share your experiences. Hey everybody, and uh, a big thank you to uh, Transforming Assessment and to the Business Education SIG for having me here. Um, mine is a bit more of a practical boots on the ground, how we experience things at UTS. So UTS, uh, pre-COVID, we had no programs taught online or hybrid. So we had a few small OPM type of projects through KeePath um, and Learning Futures was our institutional approach to teaching and learning that required at least one piece of assessment to be authentic and followed quite a lot of those principles that Poppy mentioned in her six principles uh, for authentic assessment. And the plan in 2019 was that in 2020 onwards, we had planned a shift away from formal exams with a goal of a 20% reduction in the number of formal final exams um, semester on semester. And certainly uh, that, was, that was all our, our pre-COVID so COVID certainly gave us a really big jolt to the system because we had never um, done a lot of online teaching and learning and online assessment. But some of the exemplars that are from my specific discipline area um, were quite closely aligned with those six Ps. So first one we have there is conducting an interview with audit staff members online. We used uh, Zoom and technology uh, to help students improve their graduate recruitment 
uh, mm. capabilities. Oh, thank you. Thank. Oh, you just okay. Thank you. Can you go now? Yeah. All right. So <laughs> one of the benefits of working from home. Um, so it was really about giving students real life experience uh, in doing something that would help them with their employability. The second one there uh, is one that we were doing in an authentic way for quite a long time. You know, accounting is a very hands-on, we have clear ideas of where our students want to go in the profession. So all of our assessments tended to be scenario-based of doing things for real clients. Uh, but another example is preparing analysis for a fund manager, um, put the report together, and you know, online we moved to recorded presentations uh, over Zoom given everyone was having Zoom meetings, that was certainly students said, oh, look, this actually helped me get ready for, uh, again, employability. Another one of our cohorts solved a problem for Frank Green. So Frank Green is a sustainability brand. They had themselves a little competition to pitch on an idea, and they had to use remote learning tools to be able to present that idea, do all of their research. And then the last one is something that, that I implemented myself that came from Danielle and Poppy's presentation on interactive orals. And uh, I've always been keen on doing an oral exam, but we used interactive orals for students eligible for a supplementary exam. So they had failed the subject, but were quite close. And for certain reasons of our university rules, they were eligible. We gave them a current event. Um, and then we asked them to prepare questions to some responses, but we had this interactive discussion and we could get so much more out of our students and really gauge their understanding in that interactive discussion. So you know, we've, we'd moved our paper exams, certainly in a lot of our final exams, more into this scenario base. And you know we are still doing exams um, for a particular reason. So my next slide, I wanted to really talk about the challenges because I love authentic assessment and I've you know, built all of my tasks around authentic assessment, but we have challenges. Um, and this comes in accounting, but also in other areas. So our first challenge is professional accreditation. Our professional accrediting bodies for accounting require at least 50% of our assessments to be invigilated. That doesn't mean exam, but it just means identity verified. We can be sure the student submitting the work is the one who completed the work. The second thing is technology. So we found that there were really varying levels of internet connections, whether you're behind the firewall in China, whether the VPN that we had provided for students to use in China was working or not, student personal technology, um, students who had been moved out of a major metropolitan area because of COVID, gone to, sent to live with a rural family member out in the country where they couldn't even access email. So technology was our big challenge, was one of our big challenges. The other one was time pressure. So <laughs> research demands, learning new technology, preparing materials for online and asynchronous learning, homeschooling children. Um, I think at one point we all felt like there was a bit of upskill fatigue, like how many new things do I need to learn this year or this, this term and how do I <laughs> manage to keep all that, that in place? I know that certainly the um, mental health aspect for, for my staff, you know, there are certain days I broke down in tears of I can't do this all. Um, it was a, quite a challenge. And then the last one, which is just as important as all the others, is budget pressure. So less casual academic support, less uh, time for marking. And there is lots of discussion. People say, I'd love to do this really great authentic assessment. Um, and then the question always comes, OK, how much does this cost to assess? What would be the cost? Oh, this much time. And, and that's where we get into institutional conversations about who pays for what? And is this, are we only thinking about the costs that come out of our budget or are we thinking about total cost to the university? And so while we have had, uh, you know, this great push for our authentic assessment, one of the biggest things that's facing a lot of business schools, and mine in particular, is the finances and okay, well, what's the most efficient way? And sometimes the most efficient way of um, assessing students through something like an exam might not necessarily always be the most authentic option. But we can try and make invigilated exams authentic in some way, shape or form by using case-based exams. 
questions requiring analysis as well as the answer, marking guides that take into account differing assumptions or perspectives of being very flexible. And one that I didn't add there, but also is a possibility is adding the option of, hey, if we wanna ask a student a question, that there's the option for a viva as well. So that's me done. Hopefully I wasn't longer than my three to five minutes. <laughs> Thanks so much, Amanda. Uh, moving on now, I invite uh, Charmaine Fleming to take over. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. As Dan said, I'm a uh, lecturer in sport management at Federation University uh, in Ballarat. We've been developing our new fully online international sport management um, undergraduate degree, which commences next month. Throughout the degree, the courses have been scaffolded and aligned horizontally and vertically so that curriculum progresses naturally and the assessments are authentic. I'm also going to touch on my previous role with Griffith University as academic advisor for the 2018 Commonwealth Games internship program and the authentic assessments that were developed there. The program offering we've been able to create through the partnership with the World Academy of Sport is about bringing educational and industry experts together to create a contemporary degree. This partnership has provided a point of difference from other sports management degrees with cutting edge interviews from world sports leaders and athletes and case studies which are unique to the courses and will enhance student learning. We're also offering the degree to the International Baccalaureate Schools and three courses will be offered providing direct entry into the bachelor program. In designing the curriculum and assessment tasks for the degree, a backwards design approach um, has been applied here. This began with workshops between Federation University leadership and professional staff and members from the World Academy of Sport, deliberating what knowledge, skills and qualities the ideal graduate would have. From there, learning outcomes were developed and all the materials, the assessment tasks and learning activities were constructively aligned. The weekly learning activities have been carefully designed to scaffold the assessment tasks providing students with opportunities to receive informal feedback that will assist them in their summative assessment tasks. The assessments have also been carefully scaffolded across the degree uh, with increased expectation and complexity as students progress through the learning journey. Students will also get the opportunity to relate assessments back to their particular country or region, making their learnings more powerful and applicable to them. The types of assessments include reflective writing that will enable students to develop new insights and perspectives into their professional journey into sport management, responding to bespoke case studies developed by World Academy of Sport, creating interactive video presentations, designing in infographics and participating in interactive orals. So here are a few examples of the authentic assessments within, within the degree with our uh, first year courses in first semester. Um, within the Introduction to International Sport Management, one of the assessments will involve students developing an infographic. So often in business, we need to take complex data and information and present it to general audiences in a clear and succinct manner. This is a key skill for students to learn in this degree. So now I'd just um, like to uh, touch on my experience as academic advisor for Griffith University and the 2018 Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast and how authentic assessment played an important role in this program. Just to give you a quick overview of the internship program, Griffith was the official partner of the Gold Coast 2018 Commonwealth Games and the first university to partner with the Commonwealth and Olympic Games. Um, there was 250 internship opportunities were created for students and they were enrolled in a broad range of study areas including sport management, business, IT, communications, urban and environmental planning, journalism and public relations. So part of my role involved creating authentic assessments that would benefit students in their academic and future career and industry careers. So one key authentic assessment was the electronic internship portfolio. So here students collected artifacts from their internship experiences to use as part of a professional portfolio uh, that will provide future employees with evidence of their skills and knowledge gained working with Gold Doc and the Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast. So the portfolio included things like um, tasks the students engaged in, in their internship and samples um, of the work that they completed. 
So I hope this has given you a small insight into my use of authentic assessments. Thank you. Thanks so much, Charmaine. Lots of interest there in the chat. Um, we particularly liked your um, your visual there of the different assessment types and aligning that to the Olympic rings. That works. That looked really uh, wonderful, and I think that's something that will stick with everyone. I'd like to. Uh, we've just. I'd like to now invite. Um, our first of our Irish uh, panellists tonight to step up. Uh, Fiona, would you like to join us, please? Thank you, Danny. Um, thank you for the invitation. Danny, really appreciate it. Um, and lovely to be here with you all on this sunny morning, despite what my slides are showing. Um, Danny's always interested in sort of bringing together learnings and experiences from the different hemispheres. So I thought it might be nice to um, open my talk with a picture from my garden when I was preparing this on Friday. So it was snowing and I sent these to Danny on, on Friday and today I can tell you it's a beautiful sunny morning in Dublin. And um, so it's a pleasure to be here with you all. We love learning from um, our colleagues in Australia, particularly the work we're doing with Danny, which we'll share with you in a few moments. So uh, for anyone who's heard me speak before, I always use this quote, um, it never um, ceases to inspire me um, and every time I, I think of it or read it I think of something new so I'll just give you a moment to read that and for me when I read this quote it reminds me of many things it, it reminds me that you know assessment is just so key to everything we do it's not about the QA which sometimes we get bogged down in but it also in the context of the uh, of this morning sort of this evening's talk I think it reminds us that we cannot prepare them for, for the world they're going to enter unless we use authentic or real life experience to prepare them. Otherwise, it's a wasted opportunity. Um, and it's really important, I think, that all the time we're doing any form of assessment design, that we're considering at all times, how can this value, how can this be a value to the students? How can it give them something to take away when they leave me, when I'm not there to support them, when I'm not there to give them formative feedback and guidance? And I think the more authentic it is, the better able they would be able to do it when they enter the real world or leave us. Um, and I was thinking like that back in the early noughties when Phil Race and Sally Brown were talking to us all about assessments that were fit for purpose and authentic. And then the National Forum, our own Irish National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education, had as their as their theme, their enhancement theme, assessment in the years 2016 and 17. And I love this diagram because it sort of brings together the um, value of authentic assessment for both students, um, lecturers, and of course, the kind of types of tasks. So it simplifies or demystifies authentic assessment, because for a long time, I've been looking for quotes that might re resonate with, with both myself and colleagues, whereas I thought this diagram just made it very clear and very quickly um, ideas could come into your mind in your own context about how you could create authentic assessments. I'm going to come back to this, if I may, because I'm going to stick with some work we're doing in DCU. Um, we were working up until last October on an Erasmus Plus three-year project with uh, four university, um, four Euro European universities, university partners. And part of our work was to support academics developing assessments that uh, would promote academic integrity. And uh, we used a scoping, we conducted a scoping review as a starting point and then developed this suite of principles. And these principles are designed around sort of three key categories. And one is establishing these high academic integrity standards across the university. And the next two suite of principles are around the way we design assessment and the way we involve students. And key um, to many of the principles uh, outlined in this, in this resource here is that assessments that are authentic challenge the students and engage the, student, the students. And the literature tells us that if, if, if assessments are not current or authentic, our students are more likely to resort to cheating uh, for many reasons, because it doesn't engage them, they're bored, they procrastinate, um, and that's what the literature showed us when we were developing these principles. More recently in DCU, we secured some um, funding, internal funding, and myself and a colleague, Rob Lowney, worked on it again. We developed a scoping review, and we can share all of these resources with you. Um, but the review then informed this resource, and this resource doesn't really give us anything new, except that I suppose it reminds us, or maybe validates the fact and the importance and the value of involving students in, this, in the assessment. And I think any way that you involve students in the assessment 
is authentic assessment because when they leave us they need to be able to negotiate briefs they need to be able to design or co-design briefs they need to be able to self-evaluate and peer evaluate and all of these assessment choices whether they're summative or formative support the students in this authentic way so in terms of some real experiencing in, in experiences in DCU, uh, Brian um, in IT Sligo, uh, Brian Mulligan, hello, good morning to you. We're beginning some work in um, DCU around CBL. Um, we're working as part of the European Consortium of Innovation, uh, Innovative Universities. That's my timer, so I'm nearly up. And one of the uh, challenges that we're piloting with a colleague in DCU, Derek O'Brien, is um, this one that's based on the Midlands moving from their reliance on fossil fuel energy to um, a greener, more renewable energy source. And we're working with the Midlands region, with students and with um, teams of, of lecturers, or what we call teachers in DCU. So that's one example of authentic. Um, another example, I'm moving quickly because I'm aware of time now, uh, Integrated case study. I did this with some colleagues in Griffith College when I was lecturing in the business faculty, so I thought it might be useful in, in the context this morning. So we had one case study that was working across all modules, and they had to conduct an industry strategic analysis. I was teaching HR, so they did a HR analysis on the on the industry, financial and market, and a professional development lecturer took them through the process in terms of um, the composition of the teams, the management of teams, uh, and report writing, presentation skills, all of those time management, project management, and um, he took them through those. So it was one piece of work and that worked really well. Um, and other examples, I know my colleague Monica is going to touch on here. So the only one I'm calling out, although there are many, is my colleague Marina. And I know she's in the, uh, in, in, in the group today. So she, if you have questions, you might direct them to her in the chat box or maybe later on. But she's um, using this interactive oral as an authentic assessment in sustainable aviation. And this is part of um, a community of practice that meet, group that meets every Wednesday morning, this time every Wednesday with the lovely Danny to guide us and share her experience. Um, so there are other colleagues that may be here with us this morning. I think Dervla might be coming in. She, she teaches French. Um, I know Monica's going to talk to you in a moment, so I won't steal her thunder. Good morning, Monica. And then colleagues from the Institute of Education in DCU do interactive orals with uh, early childhood literacy. So I think that's it from me. Yeah, there's some acknowledgements. Yes, that's it from me, Danny, and everybody else. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fiona. That's uh, You're doing some excellent work there. And, and hello to all of our colleagues joining us from DCU today. Uh, Monica, would you like to step up and join us now, please? Yeah, good morning, um, everybody, or good afternoon, you. Um, I feel like the poor relation here. So uh, our first speaker had six points, then another speaker had five, and I'm down to three, right? So I'm officially the assistant head for teaching excellence in the School of Computing, but uh, I prefer uh, teaching and learning myself, okay. So um, I'm going to talk to you about three case studies, so uh, very quickly. The first one is uh, in a Computing for Business uh, program. And it's a collaboration and innovation to first years. And so the assessment, it's a kind of a semester long assessment. And actually, we had to move all our modules to 100% continuous assessment for first, second, and third year students, with some exceptions. Okay, so in this um, module, the group work as a software consultancy. And this is what the, a lot of the students will be working at when they graduate anyway. Okay, and they had to um, come up with a recommendation for a client, either technology A or technology B. And each group had a different topic, um, so they could kind of give each other feedback, but they couldn't kind of copy off each other. So the students had to carry out research, they had to do a presentation on it, they had to write a group report, and they had to do an interactive oral. So uh, I'm going to give out to Danny. She told me that uh, everybody would be talking about interactive oral, and I wasn't to spend too much time on it. But basically, it's uh, where you have a chat with the students about the work. So in my case, I was their department manager. And before they went out to talk to the client, I had a chat with them about the report and the presentation and how they came with the decision. Um, and then I threw in kind of a, an out, a left field question and they, I had to see how they reacted to that. So um, it was the first time we'd done it. So Danny helped us a lot, uh, guided us through the process. And I think the students, they, they enjoyed it and they, um, they weren't as nervous. It wasn't me tackling them. Why did you say technology A and not technology B? I said, you know, tell me about why you do this and whatever. So um, I think it's great. Um, it involves a bit of effort as you go through it. You get more, you as the kind of the questioner, get more experience. And um, it's really good way. I mean, it's very hard for students to bluff uh, an interactive oral when they're there sitting in front of you. 
Um, and flying through these. So the next one I had was um, for a graduate diploma in web technologies. And this is a conversion course um, for those out of field to come into kind of the um, IT space. The module again was the collaboration and innovation module, but we had to have 50% of the marks for as an exam on this one. And normally the exam would be a closed book, three hour exam, the student had to memorize things, you know, what are the five points of this? Blah, 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 blah. So it was based on memory, which I think is madness, right? So a more authentic exam is to have an open book exam. So um, I gave them two days to do it. Because like in the real world, students will have access to the five points of this and the six steps to do something. So they don't have to memorize it. But the important thing is that they have to be able to uh, apply it. So a uh, kind of an example question was uh, outline how the five stages of the D-School design process could be applied to designing a new event space in, in Dublin Zoo. This wasn't the actual question, but to give you a flavor. So for each stage, please explain the rationale to your answer and state any assumptions you make. So like in the real world, it might be the case that the consultancy, okay, we've got to come up with this plan. Um, of course, you have access to the five steps, but we want to see, can you actually apply it? Do you understand it? What rationale, what problems have you thought? Um, and any assumptions. So you're, you're testing the students in a slightly pressurized scenario, but um, it's still real world. Um, and then the last one I thought, so I'm obviously in the School of Computing, I'm on the Computer Science Programme. So I'm the module that I'm going to talk about now is introduction to computer systems. And you might think, oh my God, we're business people. Why are you talking about that? But there's a lot of things where in business and even in accountancy, you have to work out things, you know, the profit and loss, which goes in the debit and credit side and whatever. Um, so I do a kind of a similar type assessment with my students and previously it was paper based, it was multiple choice, I had different variants, it was really tedious to mark, I had different numbers, I wrote a Japanese number in the corner so I could figure out which version of the people the exam the people the, the the students had it was horrible to mark really tedious and I was only actually checking their answer I wasn't checking how they were doing it so now what I've done is I've made it online I've random questions so for question one there's about three options that each student could be asked and what I actually do is I get the students to fill in the steps so if you're working out something if you do it for long division. So for each step, there's a way of doing it. So I'm actually checking the student's understanding. And like in a business context, you could see that if they were doing this, um, that, you know, they could, you know, carry your loss down or whatever it is. So I could see how it could be applied for that. So I, I feel that it's much more authentic and allows me to check uh, their understanding. Okay, so what are my reflections? Because we have to be reflective. Um, authentic assessment is more interesting for students. They can see why they're doing it and they can see, you know, that it's relevant to them and then it'll help them get the skills they need for when they finish. It's more interesting for the lecturer. So, for example, if I'm reading 15 different reports about 15 different topics, it's interesting for me. And even if students have somewhat similar topics, they come at it from a different angle or maybe a slightly different recommendation. I think it's really good for academic integrity because if they're all doing something different, it's hard for them to share the information with each other. Um, it's more effort, um, initially anyway, but I think it's worth it. Okay, so that's me finished. Thank you so much, Monica, and thank you uh, to all of our panellists for sharing their experience. Uh, it's so rich, and I think everyone joining us here um, today will be able to, to see the that uh, there's a lot that we can all learn from everyone's shared conversation. So I'd like to invite all the panellists now to turn on their cameras uh, and we're going to explore a few topics with you all. Um, the first one is uh, talking about student experience of the authentic assessment and their feedback. And I know, uh, Poppy, you've mentioned that you've uh, got some data there that you've been working on. Uh, I believe that uh, Fiona's also run some surveys and Amanda, you were also looking at student experience there in Charmaine. So please feel free, uh, perhaps Poppy, you'd like to start? Um, yeah, would you like me to talk about specific um, outcomes from specific assessments? Is that what you'd like me to uh, contribute to this question? Danny? Yeah, I think I think it's more just a discussion to say, generally speaking, what did the students tell us? Did they enjoy, uh, did they tell us that they enjoy the authentic assessments? Uh, can they see that what we're trying to achieve with that? What were the student outcomes? Perhaps those three areas. Uh, yeah, I think um, a lot of the, if not all of the um, panellists mentioned 
um, several uh, examples or areas where authentic assessments um, uh, contribute substantially. Um, so we've heard uh, the whole engagement. We, we've heard about um, academic misconduct or uh, lack thereof. And um, I think uh, a couple of things that I'd like to also add here is that, uh, and employability, of course. Uh, but um, in addition to, to all that, what we found from the different iterations of designing and implementing authentic assessments uh, was that um, students could um, see the links between theory and practice, enjoy uh, the experience overall and um, create, develop some appreciation about um, the work that goes behind designing those uh, uh, assessments and connecting with the lecturers in um, sharing that experience. And there was a little bit of conversation here, uh, there in one of the panelists about having students as partners in assessment. And for me, I found that this was significant in engaging them and bringing them on board um, up front uh, from the very, very first class, uh, having them on board, explaining what this is about and uh, having their input along the way. Um, it made a huge difference in my experience. So. Yes to everything that all the panelists um, commented on, uh, with a huge emphasis on students as partners in assessment uh, along the way, uh, in every way. Thanks, Poppy. Um, Fiona or Amanda, did you have something to share there on student experience? Um, can I jump in, Danny? Fiona please, here. Please do, Fiona. Thank you. Um, just to say, yeah, the, the initial feedback from the interactive world was very, very positive. You know, really lovely feedback from students in the qualitative piece around preparing me for professional life. I mean, you can't get anything more authentic than that. But when I was working on the um, integrated case study in Griffith College, um, the students, interestingly, felt two things. I can remember now, it's about 10 or you know, maybe seven years ago when I was doing this. But I remember clearly two pieces of feedback, and one was that students felt that this was a smaller and easier piece of uh, work to do across all modules, and it wasn't. I mean, in terms of word count, effort, everything, it was exactly the same. Um, and the second thing was they felt like they could talk to people in industry about that assessment that they did. And um, so it was a real valuable takeaway for them, and I think that's a really good sign of an authentic assessment. Absolutely, Fiona, it is. Um, I know, Charmaine, you've had um, students talk to you about their experience and, and they've stayed in touch with you uh, after some of you know, the uh, internships and things like that too. Is there anything you can share um, more broadly then about how, these, how the students have found it connected to their careers? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, yeah. Um, there's somewhere. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Yeah, very positive feedback from students about assessments and linking it to industry, especially with the Commonwealth Games. A lot of those students are still connected with me on LinkedIn. Um, they've gone on to be, um, they call them gamers, so they're going to the next Commonwealth Games, uh, they're working there, and a lot of them have got um, jobs within the industry due to their um, experience of the Commonwealth Games. So very positive um, assessments um, that they, you know, linked into industry, so they've been great. Yeah. Thanks, Charmaine. Okay, so we might, uh, has any of the other panellists got anything to share on that topic or shall we move on to the next one perhaps? Yeah, perhaps you can't see that my hand was up. I'll put it down oh, anyway. thanks, um, thanks. <laughs> I was using the pre-arranged signal. Um, well done. One of the best things that, that we get is anonymous and public feedback so you know every university has some sort of confessions website uh, where students can anonymously write in and they have such fantastic things to say about our authentic assessments especially in my subject like i'm going to my graduate job and the things i'm saying and the things i'm doing i'm impressing the people who are supervising me and that just makes it all worthwhile for us 
Isn't that reassuring? All the effort that we've put into the authentic assessment, the thought, the, the work that goes into um, translating what we've been doing traditionally in exams for so long uh, is certainly being recognised by the students and, and that's really powerful too. So let's move on to our next area because I think this is important and it, it's, um, you know, whilst the students recognise this work and we can recognise this work, um, we know that in business we've got particular invigilation requirements um, and that uh, accreditation bodies also have uh, very demanding uh, requirements there of us in our assessments. So I wonder if anyone has, um, and I was going to call on you Amanda first up actually, uh, to see if um, you might like to touch on this briefly. Yeah, so our next Ask Allied Business Education SIG webinar is actually um, exploring the tension between accreditation, invigilation, uh, university finances, academic workload. And this is such a difficult area to try and navigate because we all want to do the best by our students, but we also don't want to work ourselves into the ground. We don't want to ask our casual academics to work unpaid hours um, marking when we know that we've seen lots of stories about you know people given so little time to mark assessments and invigilation means lots of different things to different people uh, quite often the first common one is oh invigilation must mean an exam but we can invigilate and assure the identity of students in so many different ways um, but I think that you know, academics can get a little bit stuck in their ways we like exams because they're easy to mark on an LMS. Uh, sometimes they can be a bit quicker than marking some form of authentic assessment. So I think there's definitely some tension and uh, you know the pressure which for our international um, uh, attendees, uh, Matt put some statistics uh, in the chat before, you know we've lost probably 30% revenue cuts are pretty common across the board, thousands and thousands of staff taking redundancies. So we're certainly in some um, financial strife and we've not received a lot of government assistance either. So the government's think that universities don't need any assistance in this time. So we're definitely in an interesting place and there's lots of discussion going on amongst those bodies. Certainly accounting is one. Um, I haven't done, we don't have in our business faculty, none of our other um, discipline areas have specific invigilation accreditation requirements, but I know in law, certainly a lot of them have been waived uh, for our professional associations. So if anyone else has any other experience with those, I'd love to hear about them in the chat too. Thanks, Amanda, very much. Do any of our other panelists, um, or Matthew, would you do you have anything to share perhaps on that area of what you're seeing at Macquarie there? Uh, yeah, similar kinds of things. Um, there's been uh, professional accreditation bodies that sort of gave us a free pass, if you will, particularly in session one last year, the start of last year when the pandemic just hit. Um, but I think some of that's starting to be somewhat clawed back, if you will, um, in the sense that they're, they're sort of itching to get back to the invigilation component. Um, and Amanda point, makes an excellent point. Invigilation does not equal exam. Um, so looking at alternative assessments, um, and you know, Danielle, your um, method for doing interactive orals, I think, is a is a really you know, a vital uh, element to showing that it's possible to move forward beyond a written exam. But it's possible to do it entirely remotely online through you know Zoom or Teams or something like that. So I think we have to be creative about our solutions and start thinking outside the box. That's exactly right. It is about being creative and it is about being innovative and uh, making sure that you know we can trial and test these things to an extent I think that will satisfy the accreditation bodies as well that these new forms of assessment are going to work and that's part of uh, the, our responsibility I guess in the scholarship area uh, of trying to measure these, um, these uh, innovations and uh, new authentic assessment forms when we put them in place. So um, let's move on now and, and perhaps have a look at our next topic. Um, and it's one that's dear to my heart. So curriculum alignment, uh, Fiona, I know it's something that you're very passionate about as well. And the notion of scaffolding assessment designs both across, uh, through courses, but also across programs. Now I know you've done it at DCU there and Charmaine, you were talking about the fact that you've done that at Federation in your new international sport management course too. So perhaps you two would uh, like to talk to us a little bit about your thoughts and the importance of this. 
Yeah, I'm ha- happy to kick off there. I mean, you know, it, it, it always strikes me as as something that we, we could perhaps pay more attention to that if you walked into any virtual learning environment or synchronous class in Zoom, you should always be able to see the sense in what's going on in that learning space in relation to it being aligned with the overall program. There should never be something going on that cannot be directly tied back in some way to the program learning um, outcomes. But even, I suppose, more in a more structured way. I mean, there's lots of examples. I think your colleagues in Monash, um, Deakin University, they did a fabulous study around kind of closing that, that sort of feedback loop. And they have six really good case studies, and I'll pop it into the chat box in a minute, showing how they bring various forms of formative and summative feedback, peer self and tutor feedback into the um, scaffolded assessment design. And um, so that students get many opportunities to engage with reflection, evaluation and feedback. And um, so there's some really good examples going on there. And also the test model. I don't know if you're familiar with that. We're beginning some work on that. We've got some funding recently in DCU. We have done some some light touch work in te- with test before, but we're going to engage in it in a more, in a more um, I suppose, deep and meaningful way across programs in, um, in DCU. Thanks, Fiona. That's great. And actually, while we're at DCU, Charmaine, before I call on you, Monica, I know that you've recently been uh, undertaking this work with your colleagues and talking to them about the importance of doing this in your program there. Is there anything from your learnings uh, and working with colleagues that perhaps might be a little resistance uh, that you'd like to talk to us about? Yeah, so I find that, um, as one of the other speakers mentioned, t- uh, lectures are really wedded to the invigilated exam and that's the way to go. But I, I think what really makes a difference is if you give them examples from their area and say, I've done this with students and it's actually worked. And I, I really, I'm somebody mentioned also about, you know, at the beginning of this pandemic, we were overloaded with information from all sides about how to do things, how to change things. And I think it's really important to localize it to your context. So, for example, I think Charmaine had a piece about there, you know, reflective journal or reflective piece. I changed that to analysis because computing people don't do reflection. You know, we're just totally analytic. So I think it, it's it's very important to um, localize it to the area. Um, we're all about personalized learning for students, but you know, localized for the lecturers and examples that have worked in the discipline really speak to the lecturers. And, and like people, if they see things work, then they're not just kind of resistant for the sake of it, but once you know you show them that things can work, they they will come along with you. But it's kind of a slow enough process. Yeah, it is. It, it's about um, almost a literacy that we start to have around assessment and that shared literacy takes time to develop uh, as as we know. And um, you know, it's, sometimes it's difficult as leaders in this area um, to start that conversation, but uh, being consistent perhaps, uh, having regular conversations, communities of practice around this uh, is ways that we've certainly found uh, to improve that literacy and at the end of that process are all the students that will benefit from these uh, assessment designs. Um, Charmaine, I know that you have been looking at both horizontal and vertical alignment across your new program uh, of authentic assessments in a fully online program. So is there any learning there you'd like to share with us? Yeah, Dan, it's been one of the, the key things um, because we've obviously started this degree from scratch and um, developed all the content. So really doing a curriculum alignment across all the courses within the degree um, and then scaffolding assessment design across those programs as well. So we've had a lot of meetings um, with our learning and and teaching consultant on our curriculum alignment, uh, lining them up with our course learning outcomes uh, and program learning outcomes there. So um, that's been a huge, um, step for us to ensure that we have got the curriculum, curriculum alignment correct. Um, we're also looking at um, some of the tasks have been constructively aligned to meet our course learning outcomes. We've got formative learning tasks being scaffolded and meet the knowledge and skills and academic and digital, digital uh, literacy required for those tasks. Um, so as I said, they've been carefully scaffolded across the degree um, and we're increasing expectation and complexity as students progress through their learning journey. So obviously first year to third year students, um, our first year intake is this year. So we're looking at um, the curriculum alignment, scaffolding those assessment designs um, as we go for each year in the course. 
Thanks, Charmaine. Uh, Poppy has uh, something to add there too. Poppy? Uh, yes. Um, I wanted to say how important that curriculum alignment has been for us. Sorry, I accidentally turned my camera off. In terms of identifying um, the gaps in knowledge and the areas of repetition of knowledge because anecdotally we had evidence from the students saying oh not another class about uh, event management for argument's sake and like i haven't talked to you about this in the past um or students graduating feeling that they had um, little gaps here and there we didn't know any of that until we all sat down as a team and mapped everything horizontally and vertically, like Charmaine's example. And that also enabled us to then work backwards to create these opportunities for authentic assessments that will build, um, fill in those gaps and help them apply that knowledge into real scenarios and we literally ditched all the meaningless um, exams or other um, archaic types of assessments that were not necessarily assessing knowledge. They were just a platform to offer a student a grade. And so that has worked wonderfully for us. And I was recently looking at um, uh, where, how far our sport management degree which was one of the first um, degrees that we uh, mapped uh, and it's come to a point where it's actually quite impressive in how beautifully it's designed um, because of that alignment and the assessment design across the program and within each course in the program. That's me. Thanks so much, Poppy, and, and thank you to all of our panellists. Uh, there are a couple of other topics that I'd like to touch on in terms of uh, the role of technology and dissemination challenges, but they may well come up in our troubleshooting discussion in a little bit. I'd like to now instead uh, turn our um, attentions to uh, a, a Padlet exercise that I've put together there just to get everyone in the chat uh, involved in what we're doing and perhaps to create a really great resource that we can continue to build on even beyond this session. Uh, I'm going to put a link to the chat here to the Padlet that we're going to be using. Uh, Matthew's beaten me to it. Thank yep, you, sir. Yeah, I've done it already. Oh, you're a champion. I'm going to uh, then share my screen, actually. Um, and so I'll take us all on a little journey uh, into the Padlet. Here we go. And the purpose of the Padlet today is to share our authentic assessment designs in business schools that we're using that works. Now, I understand that not everyone is from business and you may well have some great authentic designs in other disciplines um, that you might like to add. So the instructions are at the beginning of the sway here. You'll see that um, uh, it, it's in the spirit of sharing good practice, really, uh, to create a business focused area that we can come back to um, where we talk about different authentic assessments that we might like to do that we've seen work. So step one, uh, you can um, click on the, the plus sign at the bottom, find your your discipline um, and click on the plus sign at the bottom of the column there and that will pop up a post that you'll be able to add. Um, you'll see that I've pre-populated a few of these here. So in the accounting area, um, uh, I've got the shoebox of tax receipts, which is a great way of, of asking our um, up and coming accountants to essentially prepare a, a, a mum and dad um, uh, tax um, or, or consultation there uh, based on someone coming in with a shoebox of difficult receipts to deal with. Um, there's also, you know, uh, tax scenarios there in finance, uh, looking at business plans, um, financial planning discussions and providing briefs and perhaps even creating guides on uh, for new investors on how to uh, check and measure their stocks. Uh, in economics, looking at minimum wage. Uh, and having group discussions around that perhaps. Uh, one of the ones that I really have enjoyed doing recently uh, is uh, working with students producing lobbying letters. So rather than necessarily just a report, 
um, that the students write, asking them to create an authentic artifact like a lobbying letter. So this is one that we did in a master's level sport, man, uh, sport uh, facility course uh, where they were looking at managing sports facilities and they were asked to, in a a time-based case study essentially. They had to research um, and act on behalf of uh, the World Surfing Federation to write a lobbying letter to the Tokyo Olympic Games Organising Committee uh, about the problem that surfing was going to have as a new uh, event in the Olympics um, where the, lack, the, the surf is generally considered to be fairly lacklustre around Tokyo and they weren't going to build a wave pool. So it was about arguing for a wave pool. They had to do some research as to the legacy um, uh, benefits of doing this beyond the games as well and then submit that in a very succinct lobbying letter. Uh, the students absolutely love that and that's been one that we've uh, used in lots of different um, disciplines beyond that, uh, both at undergraduate and postgraduate level as well. So things like pitching brief uh, pitching your business to investors, briefing papers. I'd love to see you guys get involved now. And uh, I can see people already are in entrepreneurship there. They're posting some uh, great examples. So do feel free to scroll along. Uh, we have a little bit of time now that uh, for you guys to add to that. Feel free once you've added yours to go through and read some of the others um, and like them and perhaps add some comments. Uh, there's one there on international trade, providing a brief to a politician, um, updating them on international trade. So obviously providing briefs or business submissions to politicians is another very employable skill. Um, and there's no reason that our students can't demonstrate their learning just as well in, in a succinct piece, like a, an infographic, um, like a, a brief or a lobbying letter, um, because it, it, it's all the same research that sits bef behind it and it's going to be more authentic to what they actually need to produce when they go out into the workplace there. So I'm just checking everyone's been able to access that in the chat and it looks like it. This is something you can all bookmark as well for uh, beyond the session. Uh, this will stay open and I'm hoping we can continue to add to it. Uh, and that those of us who are perhaps unable to join us synchronously tonight um, are able to um, enjoy, uh, join us and, and contribute uh, after the session as well. And I'm sure Matthew will be able to provide the link on the transforming assessment um, site and we'll have it in the business education SIG site as well. So I can see lots of things are coming in there now. I put uh, mine under science and tech because you missed out business info systems departments. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> but of yes, I'll put ones, a link to the Padlet on the recording page so people can find it. How about I, I, I'm happy to add add that one. What That's would all right, you like it's already to in there now. We're all good. Okay, you're all it's good. under science okay. and tech. <laughs> you can see it right in the middle tech. of the screen. <laughs> yeah, nice, I can. Yeah. That's terrific. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. I'm quite excited about the opportunity to create this resource actually because um, I, I can see there's so many benefits to us when we're looking for ideas beyond this session. Often part of the, the problem is needing to uh, think of you know, think of authentic assessment designs, what's working, how do we know it's working? So having a place where we can come back to time and time again uh, to share, um, I think is, is hopefully a, a nice takeaway from what we're talking about tonight. Okay, so we'll just give everyone another minute or so. Um, please just let me know in the chat uh, if you would like a little bit more time, but I think what we might do, um, keeping in mind time, is actually move on to our discussion there uh, about, um, uh, about troubleshooting and inviting the panel to sort of come forward on that area, because I've noticed there's been some questions um, coming up in the chat about um, designing at scale and also costs involved. So I'll just, um, I'll 
close off this screen now and go back to the slides and I invite the panellists to come forward and anyone uh, who has questions from the chat, you can raise your hand, um, but we might start by discussing at scale if possible, please. Do we have a, a panellist who'd like to lead on that one? <clears throat> sorry, Danny, can you repeat one. the question? Sorry. <laughs> Talking about developing, a, offering authentic assessment at scale, and it looks like Amanda's put her hand up there because she's got some oh, yeah. mighty big courses. <laughs> yep, off you go, Amanda. Yeah, so we have introductory accounting, which has anywhere between 1,600 and 1,800 students. And often when we think about authentic assessment, authentic often means personalised in some way. Um, so for us, it's how do we make it personalised? Is it you know, personalised per class? Everyone in one class is doing the same thing. I think sometimes it becomes a bit daunting, like how do I personalise this for 1,600 students? We have done some personalisation in some of our IT subjects and our engineering subjects uh, when we used algorithms and formulas, but of course, very clever engineering and IT students wanted to compare their personalised authentic task and then could reverse engineer the algorithms. So that's certainly been uh, one of the challenges of large cohorts for us. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. And and Poppy, did you have a thought on this too? Um, yeah, sorry, my Wi-Fi is playing up at the moment. I'm not sure if you can hear me properly. But um, in addressing Amanda's question, which is quite valid, actually, uh, in my case, I didn't have a thousand students. Um, the opportunity was open for them to choose their own organisation to do their three um, scaffolded assessment tasks throughout one course. And that particular um, sport organisation that they chose was their case for the uh, trimester. And um, that enabled them to um, personalise the experience on a lot of levels, not only because they were able to choose um, to work with an organisation that uh, they had an interest on, uh, but also they uh, personalised uh, because every organisation is by default different in some way or another in the services, in uh, the, the aims and goals, in the way it's set up, in its governance and so forth and so forth. Because of that, um, these three assessments were really reflective of the environment, the content of that particular organisation. Hence, the experience was very much personalised for the student and that came out in the data in those exact words. And um, students not only enjoyed that, but they felt that it was personalised and um, they appreciated it. And I think, yes, it's possible uh, if it's thought through from the beginning uh, to the end as to how we're going to make that experience for students uh, special and personalised, but it's possible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, uh, yeah, the personalisation is important in the, to the scalability. I know that there was a question there also about anonymity in marking assessments at scale there, um, particularly when they're personalised and how do you marry the two. Um, my query would be, I think there are cases, there are times where you don't need to marry the two. I think there are definitely times where that personalisation is important um, and I think the students value that um, and they can see when that's important when perhaps, uh, and then there are other times when that anonymity might be required. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts on that? Um, I, I don't think it kind of came up as an issue with my students. I feel like I've, you know, titchy small classes with 90 and 150 students. So <laughs> I'm not one to talk about, you know, anonymity and, and, and scale and stuff. But I think, you know, so long as students know that, that things are fair um, and like going back to the, the thing being scaffolded, to show them examples is really important because they have no idea what to expect. Um, and I think really sharing the rubrics with them um, 
gives them a sense of, oh, this is what they're asking for. So there's, you know, 30% on content or there's 70% on content and then the writing part is less or whatever. So I think if the students know that it's fair, um, I think that that really helps with the kind of anonymity kind of they felt that they would be treated fairly if they know that the, the lecturer has actually decided in advance of seeing it what the rubric is because I think students sometimes think that the lecturer does the throw them on the bed and which lands on the floor gets a certain mark and lands in the pillow gets an extra mark or whatever so yeah no, it, that's interesting Monica um, Matthew's posted here in the chat that students need to also evaluate their own performance and that of others uh, as a professional skill that's so true so there's also a, um, the importance of peer evaluation and peer assessment in there uh, that we need to um, make sure that our students are pre prepared for in terms of transversal skills there uh, so I think there's um, there's lots that are that is happening in that space. Um, there's also another big question that's come up around costs numerous times now through the chat and the co the costs of running uh, and doing authentic assessment. Uh, I'm someone who perhaps doesn't necessarily, in as a, a learning and teaching consultant, I don't actually see that big a difference because I see the amount of work that goes into writing quality questions uh, for exams, designing those pools, making sure that they are, you know, randomised, that we're really te testing higher order thinking there rather than just content. There's so much work that goes into that, uh, just as much as goes into a really creative, authentic assessment design, um, developing a cracking good rubric, uh, as I put in the chat there, and training the, the marking staff. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts about the, the costs of doing, you know, those of you who are experienced in doing both? Uh, can you see a real difference there? Um, I, I, as I put in the chat, I think a lot of the effort is upfront effort. So, for example, if we take the interactive oral that we did, so um, Myself and, and Fiona worked in this fictitious student team and, and Danny was the project manager checking it, it's how we were getting on. And like there was a lot of effort involved in designing the rubric, how we're going to phrase it, the scenario um, and all of that. But I mean, I've used that rubric um, and the, um, the exemplar on three different modules. Um, and I'm about to do another bout of interactive orals tomorrow. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so I think like the, the effort is upfront um, and like so I am marking a group of students, I am marking five students in a group, 15 minutes for the interactive oral and then I have five minutes to write it up. I know Danny sort of has a, a ballpark of maybe 10 minutes if it's just one or two people and then five minutes to write it up. But I mean I think, um, you know, if you think about the length of time it would take me to mark, you know, kind of an exam, they were written down, having to decipher handwriting which is kind of another overhead. Um, I, I mean, at the moment I'm bright eyed and bushy tailed and I think the effort is worth it. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's efficient and um, fair. Um, but, you know, I mean, Danny has more experience in this and that seems to be what her experiences, your experiences are saying as well, Danny, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, but it's, it's, you know, my experience as a designer and, and working with you all, it's, it seems to marry that the two are very, um, I would say almost equal um, in but you're right it comes down to the marking time of an exam and the design of the questions uh, whereas um, the interactive orals or, or assessment is at, authentic assessment in general the infographics um, I've actually got some uh, conveners who have been designing uh, the students are doing virtual uh, tours um, uh, on a platform uh, to demonstrate their learning uh, on creative leadership uh, or leadership in creative spaces and organisations and it's a really authentic wonderful assessment for them to do. Uh, it takes a little bit of time to think about it and work with the students on uh, perhaps co-designing a rubric there, students as partners um, and when it comes to then then the students do all the work and they actually uh, in this particular design they uh, have a critical friend in the cohort that they share their link with as they're preparing the virtual tour, get some feedback on it and then they sit at it finally Finally, with a bit of a reflection for marking, and it's got it's so good by the time it's presented uh, to to be marked that it it just is a, a flow through f against the rubric for the marker um, in terms of quality and, and feedback that way because there's been a lot of feed forward. So that's the other thing. Where do we put our feedback? Are we feeding forward? Are we feeding back? Are we doing a little bit of both? Um, I 
I don't know how to answer the cost question is, is the reality. I can't see a real difference. Um, but I wonder, um, Fiona, you're across so many different disciplines there. Um, did you have a thought on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm in a position like you um, and you know, a friend of mine said to me a long time ago, you know, you need to get back teaching Fiona because you're living in that hypothetical world and, and uh, you know, you need to remember what it's like to scale assessments. Um, and I don't know is the answer. I see people scaling them and I'm totally amazed at how they do it. Our, our colleagues in the Institute of Education in DCU are absolutely super. They have four and five hundred students. But I think scalability is a challenge no matter what assessment approach you take um, and I think the people the, the assessors or the lecturers who are really engaged in the process uh, will always find a way to make it work for their students in an authentic way. Yeah, I think so. I know it, at Griffith um, in the business school, our academics are given 45 minutes per student per trimester for marking, and that's total for all assessment items. Uh, and so we are challenged as designers then to work with you to create designs that will elicit um, artifacts that can be marked in that time. And, and that's one of our greatest challenges as designers there. Um, Poppy, did you have a thought on this? Uh, yes, I was going to make a comment about the scalability challenge and um, in the two large courses that we run, um, authentic assessments, uh, we collected and we collected some data, we found that in one case uh, it was successful, in the other case it was successful but, and the but was literally uh, on the fact that there was not much communication between the primary convener and the um, uh, tutors. So the, the point that I want to make here is that with regards to scalability, it's not only important to have the right materials, the right rubric to share it, to engage the students and so forth. It's equally important to explain all that and engage your tutors in the process because they are the ham in the sandwich. In a lot of cases, um, if they're not excited about that authentic assessment, if they don't understand it and they don't embrace it, it's hard for them to sell it to students and then we have bottom-up problems uh, rather than top-down. And um, I think from our experience, uh, engaging that middle management uh, area, the, the ham in the sandwich, what I like to call the tutors, um, is very important. Thanks, Poppy. I'd like to now open up the floor. Um, I've picked up some of the main themes there that have been questions in the chat. Uh, if you have a question for our panel, and I'll ask all our panellists to turn their, their cameras on now, um, would you uh, like to raise your hand and we'll, um, we'll answer it? You can take the mic. Not seeing any. There we go, Marina. Thank you, Marina from DCU. Please uh, take the mic and, and come and have a chat. Hi, Danny. Thank you very much, everybody, for this very interesting and informative presentation. It's really great to see all the various experience that you had. Uh, me, I'm wondering, will it make sense uh, for universities, for schools, or, or for programs to create a matrix of assessments with the deadlines? Because I know that it makes sense, but some universities they don't do it. Uh, with the type of the assessments and the timings and see how uh, and what type of assessments they should be included uh, depending on uh, the year uh, or even the, uh, the module uh, of the student. So Marina, are you talking about a, a, uh, a matrix of when things are due and all the different types of assessment that's possible? Is that what you're referring to there? Well, the types of the assessments, but also the learnings uh, from its assessment. Yes, Fiona. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marina. 
Um, there is a new facility, uh, a plug-in in Moodle that we have in DCU, um, and, but it does rely on the whole program team using it. And effectively, if all of the program team input their assessment uh, into the virtual learning environment, it produces that schedule you're talking about and allows you to track the different types of assessment that's used across the semester and allows you to identify bottlenecks. Um, but it does rely on everyone on the team using it. I know Monica uses some sort of an Excel matrix, don't you, to try and track. Um, so yes is the answer, but it's just it's done in different ways in different programs. Yeah, so we were primarily doing it to um, <clears throat> so that lectures wouldn't land on the same week to do assessments with everybody. Um, so that because the students, you know, everybody picked a week six in the middle of the semester is great to have a, an assessment. So as to give lecturers insight into what other colleagues were doing and when they were assessing it and also the percentage that was going with each piece of assessment, and also what type of assessment was it, you know, a, a program they were writing, was it a project report, whatever it was. So um, but academics could see that the students were under a lot of pressure and say, well, maybe I'll bring mine back to week five. Um, so the students, so a better spread of assessment out there. But that other piece of the higher order, kind of, you know, the blend of what they're doing, what they're assessing, that's kind of, I suppose, the next stage. But like, one step at a time kind of you're bringing your academics with you rather than alienating them absolutely poppy did you have something there as well uh, yes i wanted to add to what monica was saying for us it happened organically because um most of the courses would have a mid-term exam so mid-term exam is mid-term so it will be around week six week seven so all the uh work was you know, push there, then as you move on with the course content and uh, knowledge advancement, you tend to have another assessment towards the end so you can assess all sorts of things that you delivered throughout the trimester. So we started to get a lot of, uh, not complaints necessarily, but student request, can I get an extension? Or they wouldn't turn up in class. And, you know, well, where are the students? Oh, we have uh, an assignment due this week. I'm like, okay. So basically, um, it was pretty much in department meetings uh, that the conversation commenced with um, my students were not here in class or my students need an extension because they have an assignment at your uh, course and, and your course and my course. And this is where we thought, okay, this is crazy. Um, we need to map it out and see what's going on and then um, create a work model for the students that will enable them to perform and spread the workload across the trimester. And this is where the work on formative um, assessment and or non-formative assessment um, became uh, sort of more prevalent in the sense of, okay, the first four weeks, we need to have a, a short uh, and sweet assessment to see how students are progressing, in particular targeting some courses, whether it's first year courses or whatever the case might be. And um, yeah, it was quite interesting and quite engaging and very successful in the end. So yeah, we had that experience and it's definitely uh, a good practice. Thanks, Poppy. And charmaine has got something to share there also. Yeah, I think that was uh, one of the key things with our degree, like we had a lot of brainstorming meetings about, okay, we want to do authentic assessment. Obviously, we don't want to all do interactive orals or we all don't want to do infographics. So it's looking at a variety of different assessments that we can use. Um, and I think that is one of the key things because it's great having authentic, authentic assessment, but if you've got four courses that have the same assessment, then you're going to come into issues with the students, especially if they're doing all those four courses in one semester. So again, variety there is a key. But as far as assessments go, yes, it can be a bit of an issue because uh, if you're identifying students in, with issues, then you, if you want an assessment in the first four weeks, then if all the four courses have got an assessment in the first four weeks, then it's overload for the students. So, yeah, juggling that time of um, when assessment, your first ass assessment is due to uh, look at indications for students with uh, problems there. So definitely a challenge, yeah. That's very true, Charmaine. And, and actually, uh, there's a... a message there's a question in the chat here about scaffolding different types of authentic assessment across different 
year levels. And I know that when we do our curriculum alignment, uh, we really look at the development of the transversal skills towards employability. So we want them to develop, you know, uh, their oral communication skills, their written communicational skills, their digital literacy. When we when we look at the gamut of 21st century skills that need to be covered there, we actually do map them horizontally and vertically across the program and marry that with the different assessment types that are going to allow students to demonstrate and develop those skills. And then we also work back into the courses and make sure that we're formatively uh, embedding activities there for them to develop the skills that we're going to include in the assessments. So there's actually Actually a lot of work to be done if we go back to that topic we were discussing on curriculum alignment there there's a lot that we can do in this space to ensure success uh, and make sure that the work that we do in embedding authentic assessment in our business courses uh, is worthwhile uh, and it's going to, to have the um, benefits that we hope it will um, so I can see there's a number of people that need to head off um, are there any other questions uh, that we can bring forward or uh, Matthew, I might hand over to you. Um, I, I'll just share the slides there and we can um, perhaps uh, finalise. Where are we? There we go. Just jumping in. Sorry, everybody, it's a bit of a big file tonight. Um, but it's great to hear that so many people have enjoyed their time with us this evening, everybody. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, you uh, coming along. So there we go, sharing that on the screen. So we've been discussing and, and troubleshooting um, and we've had a great QA session there. Uh, I know that we would all on the panel love you to stay in touch with us. Um, so here are all our panellists. I'd like to thank all of our panellists joining us from, uh, you know, uh, Professor, um, Associate Professor Poppy there and Amanda and Charmaine, Fiona, Monica from uh, Ireland, all our Irish, Irish colleagues joining us in the, the um, chat as well tonight. Um, Matthew for co-chairing with me. Uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us and uh, please feel free to connect with us. The slides will be available on the site after the session. Um, just a little plug, Amanda did mention that our next webinar, certainly for the business education SIG, we'll be looking at the uh, professional accreditation and online assessment requirements and, and the difficulties uh, that exist in that space and what we can uh, do to Im improve the the um, communication, I think, and also uh, between the two entities about what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we can find other ways um, to uh, invigilate that doesn't have to necessarily be exams there. Uh, Matthew, would you like to talk to the next TA webinar as well? Sure. So the next one is on student agency and confidence in assessment. Now, we did have a panel in the previous session touching on a similar, but this is taking somewhat of a different angle. Um, let me just put the link into the text chat so you can click that and register if you want. Um, we are just about on uh, almost 8.30 Sydney time. So thank you very much everybody for joining. Um, please provide some feedback on this session and we will share it with the presenters. Hopefully we'll see you all next time. Looking forward to the next one. I'm going to shut off the recording. <laughs> so.